fans, welcome back to Road 237. As I continue my horror anthology month for the month of Halloween. And this time it is 1990's Tales from the Dark Side, the movie. Which, of course, is the film adaptation of Tales from the Dark Side. Which I've always been a big fan of. I, I used to watch this as a young kid when uh, sci-fi would play reruns. <clears throat> but I never actually seen the film until just now. Um, and I have to say, I definitely would have to agree with uh, Tom Savini. Because I do believe Tom Savini did do the, uh, 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 the makeup effects for this. But he said he considers this to be the true Creepshow 3. And if you go and look at my epic rant of Creepshow 3. You know how much I hate that movie. This one I actually enjoy. Uh, I do want to see if Tom Savini did do the makeup. I'm pretty sure he did. I, I think he was involved with it. It was directed by John Harrison, who actually did the score for the original Creepshow. Along with, actually, a couple of uh, George Romero films. Day of the Dead. Uh, yep, Day of the Dead, um, okay, that was it. He's also the executive producer of Diary of the Dead and The New Dude that's coming out. But let's see, Tom Savini, was he... I probably should have looked this up before. Can't really find anything. It, but uh, Thomas Avini was quoted as saying that this is the real Creepshow 3. It does have a stellar cast. Um, we have um, Debbie Harry, a young uh, Matthew Lawrence, Christian Slater, James Rebar, Harry Morgan, uh, Steve Buscemi, Julianne Moore... A really stellar cast like the first creep show and there's actually uh, three stories I, I know the original poster said four chilling tales but I think there's actually three and one is actually a, a Stephen King story which uh was supposed to be on Creepshow 2. I think they filmed it, but it was later used for this film. I really like that story. That's probably my favorite one of the whole film. The first story is actually by uh, uh, Arthur Conan Doyle, the guy who created Sherlock Holmes. The third one I really enjoyed as well. It's very different, and it has probably the best uh, makeup effects in the whole film and it does have a wraparound so this one is definitely more in spirit to creep show than creep show three <clears throat> and yeah the uh, uh the wraparound is basically a modern telling of hansel and gretel because uh matthew lawrence which this was three years before uh mr doubtfire so he's actually a young kid He's held prisoner by Debbie Harry, who's like this witch, but it's in like suburbia, not like a cottage out in the woods or like a spooky castle or anything. Sorry, allergies. I can't, I can't fucking shake it. So, but each story I, I could definitely see being either in Tales, Tales from the Dark Side, certainly. Or even Tales from the Crypt or like an EC uh, comic story. Definitely something I could see being a creep show. Especially the second one. I, I, I think the reason why I like the second one so much is because it has a real gothic feel to it. Um, the actor that's in it is is great. Which uh, I'll, I'll get to that story. 
But basically, uh, uh, Matthew Lawrence, he's chained up in this cell in, in the pantry of the house. Uh, uh, Debbie Harry, the, sing the singer for Blondie. Actually, probably one of my favorite female singers. I've always liked her voice. She's getting everything ready to cook him. And to kill time, he reads her stories from this thick Tales from the Dark Side story uh, book. And the first one is called Lot Number 249, which I think was direct... <clears throat> it says Michael McDowell. Oh yeah, so he he wrote the screenplay for Lot 249 and the third story, uh, Lover's Vow. Then George Romero, Cat from Hell, because it was supposed to be used for Creepshow too. And in this, <clears throat> uh, we have a young Steve Buscemi, because of course this was two years before Reservoir Dogs. He's one of my favorite actors. I mean, he either does a killer performance, like in... Reservoir Dogs, or Fargo, or Boardwalk Empire. Or he does really obnoxious Adam Sandler movies, like Crazy Eyes, The Homeless Guy from Big Daddy. Uh, wasn't he a drunken guy on a Wedding Singer? Of course, the weirdo in uh, Billy Madison. But anyway, I've always loved Steve Buscemi. Great actor. Uh, he plays this grad student who, he, he was supposed to be going for this scholarship. He was competing for a scholarship, but he got framed for theft by these two, uh, classmates played by Julianne Moore and Robert Sedgwick because he was competing with them. They framed him for theft, so... He lost the scholarship. Julianne Moore's sister, uh, excuse she's the sister of uh, Christian Slater, and Robert Sedgwick is his best friend. So basically, Steve Buscemi buys this ancient mummy, and he uses the incantation to bring the mummy to life and go after, um, go after Julianne Moore and... Robert Sedgwick, which he does, <clears throat> and then of course Christian Slater, of course he's doing his Jack Nicholson impression like he does in every movie, he kills the mummy and uh, asks for the scroll to bring the dead back to life from... <clears throat> uh, from uh, Buscemi, but Buscemi gives him uh, a fake, and then he has a real incantation to bring more and Sedgwick back to life to go after uh, Christian Slater. I went through this one kind of quickly because it is my least favorite. I do like the look of the mummy. Um, he does snip the uh, wrappings off of him. The way the mummy kills, uh, he uses methods, like, I think it's Sedgwick, he sticks a hook way up his nose, kills him via ways of uh, the mummification process. Christian Slater cuts the mummy up with the electrical knife. <clears throat> it's... It's not really a bad story. It's definitely weak consider, uh, compared to uh, Cat from Hell and uh, Lover's Vow. But Steve Buscemi is great at it. it. Christian Slater, of course, is acting like Jack Nicholson. But the <clears throat> uh, Julianne Moore and Robert Sedgwick come back to life and go after Christian Slater. So then... Uh, the Matthew Lawrence reads the next story to her, which is called uh, Cat from Hell, which is kind of similar to Edgar Allan Poe's uh, Black Cat, except it's like a... <clears throat> I don't even know what kind of cat it is. The uh, I've always called them cooed cats, like the 
striped ones, like a regular house cat. But there's this uh, really old, <clears throat> rich man that lives in this mansion by himself, played by a uh, William Hickey, who people might recognize from uh, Christmas Vacation, Mouse Hunt. To me, he's uh, Dr. Finkelstein from uh, A Nightmare Before Christmas. He was also an episode of Tales from the Crypt. He was the guy who was in love with this young, beautiful woman. And he kept having operations to make himself younger and handsome. You know, first his legs, then his arms, then his face, then his body. So by the time he was completely transformed, he had no money left. And she ended up dating the guy that they took body parts from, who now looks like him as an old man, because he he has all his money. So, it, classic Tales of the Crypt, where the twist is the guy totally screwed himself. But, William Hickey, awesome job in this. Uh, he believes this cat has been killing his, you know, his... Uh, sister and her friend and then his butler uh, systematically and that he's next. So he hires this uh, hitman played by uh, David Johansson to stay the night in his house to kill the cat. And the reason why I like this segment so much is because one, it does take place in a very big mansion. It is very much like the Black Cat by Edgar Allan Poe in some way. You know, this old man fe fearing this cat. I know I sound like shit. <clears throat> um, but the, the, the color palette of this segment is very gray. It's got a very hammer feel to it because it's this very gray... You know, his suit is gray, his hair, the in, the interior of the mansion. He's got this very gothic hammer feel. Also, there's a lot of close-ups. The actor, David Johansson, who plays the hitman, has a very Lon Chaney Jr. feel to him. He kind of looks like Lon Chaney Jr., talks like him. The way his hair is slicked back and he wears a suit. He very much does remind me of Lon Chaney Jr. So it really feels like a mixture of like Tales from the Dark Side that sort of looks like Hammer doing a Universal Monster film. <laughs> it's like the perfect mix of just everything gothic that I love. And, you know, we see through flashbacks that, you know, the cat walked underfoot of his elderly sister who tripped and fell to her death. And uh, then her friend died in a similar way. The butler, I always forget the actor's name. He was uh, Sosa's silent assistant in Scarface. He would go on to be Jerome's father in Gotham. Mark Margolis. Yes. Uh, oh, I guess he was also in uh, Breaking Bad. He was supposed to bring the cat, I think, to like the vet to get put down. But the cat caused him to have a car accident, died. And basically it's this, you know, no pun intended, cat and mouse game between this hitman and this cat. And he just can't do it. He, The cat will not die no matter what he does. And eventually he even has a gun with the red dot light. And the bullets go seemingly pass. You know, swerve around the cat. And the cat, you know, eventually... Oh, that's how his sister's friend died. The cat, like, wrapped around her face and she suffocated natural causes it was ruled as the cat sort of does that to him in this it scratches him up you know he gets bloodier and cut up 
<clears throat> but the way the effect at the end really was cool. <laughs> the cat lunges at him. It, like, hits him in the mouth. And the cat, like, crawls in. Like, you see his jaw stretching. And the cat, like, just goes down his throat. Eventually, he chokes to death. And we just see the cat go all the way in. And we see, like, bulge in his stomach as the cat, like, settles and rests. Then Dr. Finkelstein comes home. He's in his wheelchair. He sees... The guy, the Lon Chaney Jr. guy, he really did remind me of him, too. Dead on the floor, covered in blood. And he had these pills because he says how he had this company that was trying to synthesize some sort of poison for cats. And he killed like 5,000 cats. So he has these pills as he sees the, you know, the bulge of the cat in the guy's stomach. Kind of come through and through his his throat. And then we just see the cat poke its head out of his mouth. And like the big stretched out mouth as the cat climbs out. Great effect. I thought it looked awesome. He's trying to get the pills ready. The cat jumps up in his lap and hisses at him. Dies of a heart attack. And that was, uh, that was the end of the story. Um, yeah, I just, I really loved the cinematography of it. Like it has really awkward close-ups and really utilizes the atmosphere of the inside of this Gothic mansion. It has a very somber color palette, like a lot of gray. And it just, it really made me feel, it really felt almost like a Hammer film or like a throwback to Hammer, sort of like when Tim Burton did Sleepy Hollow. But with the actor, uh, David Johansson, just the way he looked and sounded and somewhat acted like Lon Chaney Jr., it just mixed with the gothic feel and with an actor like William Hickey, it just really put me in the mindset of like a classic universal or hammer gothic film and that's why I enjoyed it so much so then we get to the final story which uh Debbie Harry lets him read because it's a love story she, she likes love stories and this one was written by uh, Michael McDowell as well it is based on the Yuki, Yuki Ana, a spirit in Jack, Japanese folklore. Specifically for the 1904 version, Kwaidan, Stories and Studies of Strange Things. There was a, there's an anthology film, I think for the 60s, called Kwaidan, that might actually have that story. Yeah, it was later used as the basis for the 1964 film Quite On. I wanted to get it for this uh, uh, marathon. But this has <clears throat> uh, James Remar, who of course plays Dexter's dad, Harry. Very young in this. This is the oldest thing I've seen him in. He's a struggling artist who lives in this studio apartment. He gets a call to go down to down to the bar where his agent is. His agent uh, drops him right there, so he has no agent. Sounds like his ex-wife uh, is pretty much saying she wants completely nothing to do with him. So he uses the last of his money to get drunk, and the bar owner decides to, to walk him home. Right outside of his apartment building, there this gargoyle statue comes to life. Which, the opening of the story I really like. Because we kind of get this sort of aerial view. And then it just goes right over like the, the back of this gargoyle statue. It like, looks right down. Down the front of it. Cool looking statue. So the 
this gargoyle comes to life, decapitates the bar owner. It goes up to James Rebar and says, you know, I'll let you live. Which actually... Yeah, it's like this, this seed here. I actually think, oh, that's what the uh, silhouette is. But you have to promise never to say anything what you just saw. Don't mention me, don't draw or show you. Know, nothing about what you just saw. And I'll let you live. So, so, okay. And that night he meets this uh, a, a, a woman. They stay the night together. Oh, the gargoyle does scratch him. But they meet somehow. They find each other. And, uh... Oh, he meets her in another alley. She's played by Ray Don... Ray Don Chong. <clears throat> uh... She got lost trying to meet some of her friends, looking for a taxi. Uh, says, he tells her, if you come up to my apartment, you can call for a taxi there. There, she decides to stay with him. They spent the night together. Uh, he kind of just starts drawing again. They sort of fall in love. He has a, it, it, he just finds gr great success. He becomes a huge artist. His agent takes him back. She tells him that she's pregnant. And he asks for them to get married. She accepts. Then we jump 10 years to the future. They have two kids together. He's very wealthy. He's very successful. And it's the 10 year anniversary of the night they met which is also the night the gargoyle killed his friend. And, uh, I, I kind of missed why he, he does this on the 10th anniversary. Cause he made it sound something about wanting to move to the country, but she doesn't want to. I, I kind of got the impression that she was kind of bored. But uh, he decides to tell her the truth about that night. And she's kind of questioning, why are you telling me this? And he says, because you've already given me everything I could ever ask for. I've given you everything I could possibly give except the truth. Then she gets very upset, and that's when we hear the voice say, you promised. And I did not see this twist coming. That's another reason why I give this story a lot of credit, because I didn't see this twist coming. Uh, I thought for sure the gargoyle was going to come and kill her, maybe his kids or whatever. But no, turns out she is the gargoyle. And we see, like, her face start to morph, and her her skin rips to reveal the gargoyle is underneath. And great effects, awesome effects. I would put it up there, well, I don't know if I go as far as to say it's as good as, like, the transformation scene in American Werewolf in London. But it is very well done. I I thought it was excellent. To see, you know, because, like, the gargoyle has, like, spikes on its knees and its shoulders. And, like, to see it break through her skin and to see, like, her foot split open and come out. And he's like, you know, but I loved you. And the gargoyle pretty much says, like, well, a deal's a deal. And I, I loved you, too. It did kind of... The full... The final form, once 
she's fully transformed. And then we hear the kids screaming. The kids turn into little gargoyles as well. Uh, does... I mean, it also looks good. Very good animatronics. Practical. But I think the effect looks the best during the transformation. So, of course, she bites his throat out, he dies, she takes the children who are now fully transformed, they go up to the roof and turn back into stone. And then, you know, we get the epilogue, which is uh, Matthew Lawrence is able to escape by, because uh, uh, Debbie Harry's like pushing some sort of cart with a bunch of implements to get get him prepped and ready to cook he like pushes her she falls on something that stabs into her grabs his keys undoes his shackle pushes her in the oven you know basically Hansel and Gretel takes the cookies that she was using to try to fatten him up it's like I love happy endings takes a bite of the cookie end of the movie and I, I like the music at the end of it. It's got this really cool, the kind of like synth music you would hear through a, like a, a film like this or like Halloween type music. I really like this anthology. It had, you know, three stories. I, I thought each one was at least well written and well acted. I just thought the first one was not as strong. Each one is definitely something I can see being in Tales from the Dark Side of the show. Uh, it's only R-rated because there's a couple uh, couple F-bombs. Uh, there's one sort of sex scene between James Remar and... Uh, Ray Don Chong in the last story. But, you know, I, I really love the cinematography of the second story. Like I said, it's this great Edgar Allan Poe, universal, hammer sort of feeling story. Uh, at least it, it made me think of, like, Edgar Allan Poe and sort of looking like a hammer film. Reminded me of Lon Chaney Jr. Really liked the effects in that in the last story. I, I even liked the sort of tragic love story. I, there's a few segments I've seen that are based on Japanese stories that have like tragic love in it that I re really enjoyed. Even that piece of shit film, Scary or Die, there's like a, a Japanese story about... It's, it's called... Uh, uh, something lament is the name of the segment. It's like this tragic love story. I've always liked the Japanese love horror stories. It, ha it utilizes tragedy very well. It is miles, 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 miles better than Creep Show Three. Much fucking better. This should have been Creep Show Three. I totally agree with Tom Savini. Again, I'm pretty sure he did do the effects. I don't see it on the back here or here on Wikipedia anywhere. I don't, I wish I had looked before. Uh, see if he did before I made this video. Uh, some segments were planned for a, a sequel. There was gonna be Robert Block's Almost Human Stephen King's short story Pinfall, which was supposed to be a creep show too. And uh, Rainy Day Season, of course, the sequel never happened, unfortunately. But, yeah, I really, oh, I, I can click on Tom Savini's name. I just wanna, filmography, 1990, Two Evil Eyes. Okay, no. He did not. Oh, that's actor. Let's see, as makeup effects, two evil eyes. 
Okay, so Tom Savini was not on this. Uh, let me go to Google. But as an anthology, I, I even did mind the uh, uh, the bookend story. Sure, it was just like uh, like a modern Hansel and Gretel. Uh, just give me one second. Effects artist. I just want to be able to clear that up before I finish this. Oh, K and B. Duh. Uh, I do that. Uh, Robert Kurtzman, Greg Nicotero, and Howard Berger. The guys that did Day of the Dead and, and Evil Dead 2. Yeah, they did the effects. Wonderful job on uh, Cat from Hell and of Lover's Vow. Loved the effects and just a really fun anthology. Definitely recommend it. Again, way fucking better than Creepshow 3. But anyway, uh, thank you for watching. Oh!